This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of Vast Wasteland. kids doing up here in the attic? Come at it, Winnell. There's nothing to watch. <laughs> Come, Nitch. Everything's 3D Hollywood today. I remember back when I was, I was your age, we used to just uh, get our old TV set, no satellite hookups or anything, just took our signals out of the air. But wasn't that dangerous? Well, of course, uh, before the uh, Surgeon General found a link between uh, TV signals and cancer, that was before your time. Remember some old 2D shows, though? Uh, some are even in black and white. Wow! Of course, that was uh, before President Turner put that enforced colorization law through in the 20s. Those shows must have been really boring. They weren't even interactive. Uh, don't be so sure about that. There were some great shows back then. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look at this. Mm. Ooh, what? what's that? Oh, it's called a VCR. <laughs> Uh, see, back before all the video was put directly into computer memory in the comnet, people used to tape shows. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, there's, there's a tape already in here. Let me let me hook this up here. Let me see what we got. Uh, oh, ooh, oh, damn radiation! <laughs> Come back with us to the '60s and '70s, the dwelling place of the lost generation. An era whose heroes, role models, and very lives were molded and formed by weekly installments of favorite television programs. Welcome to the place your parents didn't understand. Welcome to the vast wasteland. Welcome, Welcome home. home. <laughs> exciting episode of Vast Wasteland. I'm your host, Mark Schmidbauer, along with Wilbert Neal and Marty Wiley, and we're here to talk about 60s and 70s television. Well, we just haven't seemed to have uh, taped a show for about two months. You've been seeing episodes, but, you know, we tape months in advance in television biz, and uh, we're on hiatus, that's the word, while they were putting new equipment in the station. So, uh, uh, just a few notes, uh, actually a lot of notes before we, uh, before we go on. Um, as normal, just want to tell you, we're on, as usual, Tuesdays at 6, Wednesdays at 10, and Thursdays at 3 p.m. here on ACTV Cable 21. And uh, if you wanted to write to us for some reason, or who knows, we're at box 15, 14, 11, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. And let's see, uh, some other notes. Uh, oh, gee, uh, what were we going to talk about? Uh, well, the big news, of course. Uh, and you'll be seeing it on ACTV is... More than you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, more than likely. Is we were bestowed the wonderful best series on ACTV. Let's start it for it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, we're uh, just devoting ourselves to bringing more and more of this silly programming to you after that wonderful we award. We should be honest, though. We did tie with another series. That's right. What was the other What's series? What's going on? What's going on? And we want to. Which is okay. And we want to <laughs> congratulate them too. And uh, also, you may be wondering if you've been watching and you're a regular watcher, the two or three regular viewers of the show. Well, notice that uh, at the last few shows I've been saying, and next week on Vast Wasteland, and it hasn't been that show. Well, 
Then we, uh, he also, lies. I lie. Yes, that's it. <laughs> well, no, we're getting no. him into therapy, though. Yeah. Well, see, what happened was uh, uh, there was a technical screw up during the, the big hiatus periods, and they were showing him in the wrong order. But now we're back on track, darn it. Yeah, so, that hiatus stuff is painful, too. It but is. Anyway. Ow. <laughs> so, anyways, tonight on Vast Wasteland is another of our exciting versus shows. Tonight, it's. The Addams Family versus the Monsters. What with the big uh, Addams Family movie that uh, by the time you're viewing this will either be out or have been out for a little while. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so it's certainly a, a point of contention right now. But Addams versus the Monsters. Uh, which one do we want to talk about first? Or just either both or either. What do you want to talk about, Wilbert? Well, by golly, let's... I'll, I guess we'll start off with the Monsters since they, at the time that they were on, I guess I felt they were my favorites because they had more of your traditional monster roles in them. Although silly as they were, they were more traditional monster roles. Your your Herman Munster, the Frankenstein monster role of the thing. Your 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 Lily Munster, the vampire kind of role. The Eddie Munster, the little werewolf guy. Um, Marilyn, who was, I guess, your average damsel in distress who just kind of didn't fit in at all, but yet right. there she was. And um, Grandpa Munster, the, the toothless Dracula. <laughs> and mad scientist. Yes, right. he was kind of all that wrapped into yeah. one. Although they, they did a few movies where Dracula was kind of the mad scientist thing, where they couldn't find, they had, to, they had to have a mad scientist in there, but they had Dracula in there already. They didn't want to have too many people, so they made Dracula a mad scientist, and that kind of carried over to the Munsters. And actually... Grandpa built Herman for Lily. Yeah? Is that true? Yeah. Well, by golly, you well, got golly, the book there. Well, golly, it's there in the book. Let's, let's well, that's that what in. I always thought. I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take a look at that. that well, first, I did want to say was that um, uh, I've heard some people, uh, when they were talking about the two shows, say, oh, well, Monsters is just a clone of Adam's family and or vice versa. In re and they said that one was just a cheap knockoff of the other. Not really, because they, they uh, premiered within six days of each other, both in 1964 on December 18th for uh, Adam's Family and September 24th for the Munsters. So they were not knockoffs of each other, but it was just that, that peculiar thing that used to happen in television, uh, kind of similar to uh, Captain Nice and Mr. Terrific, two shows <laughs> that hit almost exactly the same concept. Hitting almost exactly the same time, going off the air almost exactly the same time. Yes, no. Can you say corporate spy? Yeah. <laughs> or something? Well, <laughs> come on, this is television. Everyone's, uh, you know, uh, honest and, and gentle in, in television. Yeah, welcome <laughs> to the real world, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> they are saying that Herman was, was built by Dr. Frankenstein, so, well, there we are. Is that what they say? Well, I was always under here. the impression that Grandpa put him together. Well, Grandpa kind of kept him going. Was he just a maintenance yeah. man? Yeah. <laughs> Grandpa kept right. him going. Put him into the pit stop every once in a while. Just zzz, zzz. <laughs> the little bolts off the fingers. <laughs> well, I always thought Adam's family was better. I have to admit that. And I, of course, as a kid, I didn't understand any of it. Right. Exactly. See, that's the thing about it. As I got older, it's like, it's like, um, okay, the Batman Green Hornet thing. When I was a kid, Batman was just my favorite. But Green Hornet is is just far better. And so it's it's the same kind of thing. It's the, with age, you get um, sophisticated, and you can understand the sophistication of the shows, and you get away from the gimmicky kind of thing, you go more towards um, the better show. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Neal. <laughs> right. And for my next dissertation, <laughs> we shall discuss the, the, the Adams family. <laughs> well, and, and the thing was, you, you had, both of them were kind of takeoffs on sitcoms, really. Yes. But one was... The, well, actually, both were basically the family, the family type sitcom where most of the action takes place inside the home, except they said, well, these monster movies and the uh, are really doing pretty well right now. All the kind of monster slash bikini type movies <laughs> were, were seemed to be big there in the in the '60s, and uh, they said, mm -hmm. you know, we could we could make some big bucks off of this. <laughs> Let's hear it for, oh, what's his name, Mr. King of the B-Movies, whose name just escapes me Roger right Corman. now. Corman. Roger Corman. Roger yeah. Corman, yeah. Roger Corman. Gosh, he man. Was, he was, the, he was <laughs> the master of those things. It was all because of him that those things was, went on like that. That's right. Those great bikini movies and all, and monster movies, too. So. Well, let's see. We well, had, I just uh, enjoy the characters on The Addams Family more. They, Gomez was one father, one TV father that 
you never really wondered what he did for a living. <laughs> well, he was a success. He was a successful businessman. You looked at it, and and he was making big enough. They were just they had to make rich. big money. He had to for keeping up the house and the and buying all the exotic stuff they bought. He, and I mean, they was, went through electric trains like, like nobody's boom. business. <laughs> I think he probably has stock in those. <laughs> well, see, that's, see, my my concept, and they never really explained this was that that Gomez was a successful Wall Street businessman and he went nuts at one point <laughs> no. possibly well possibly because of uh his uh it's, it seems like his family line was pretty much uh predisposed toward that <laughs> or what for whatever reason and the board of directors for whatever company he was running said well he's still making money for us so uh we'll just let him come in and keep making decisions i mean does something too crazy, we'll stop him. And apparently they don't. Because <laughs> okay. he just keeps clicking along. Gomez, a wealthy lawyer with bizarre taste, an <laughs> insane leer, and a double-breasted gangster suit. <laughs> <laughs> the word double-breast. Oh, I see. Well, no, <laughs> we'll deliver that. I see. It's the gangster suit thing. It's, it was a lovely pinstripe suit. I always enjoyed that. And a cigar. And, and a lawyer, though. Margaret Hamilton was actually part of the Adams family. As, as who? Mrs. Crump. Oh, that's right. Ophelia and Morticia Crump's mother. Oh, that's right. That's Frump. true. You remember Frump. 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 They're close together. They're automatic peak names. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Frump. <laughs> because wasn't he actually supposed to have married Ophelia? Right. That was. But he fell in love with Morticia. Exactly. They had that in the lovely flashback episode. Yes. Yes. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> she could pull those flowers out her head. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. No. <laughs> well, I guess that is something to uh, to attract you to a woman, pulling the flowers out of the head. Right. That's lovely. <laughs> and when you look at uh, Carolyn Adams, uh, Carolyn Jones, Jones, Jones. Jones not Carolyn, Adams, Carolyn Jones on the show, they uh, said about uh, the fact that uh, when you the, the the dress she wore, that they pretty much had to had to pour her into that into that thing, and that. Uh, they had to get her out of it immediately because it cut off a heck of a lot of circulation. <laughs> and she basically, in fact, there was one episode, or I think was it the movie or something, or the um, the TV reunion or something, where she had to go up the stairs. And it was like, they had to redesign the dress because there was no way <laughs> for her to get enough, you know. Because <laughs> she, I mean, she could basically creep around. That was about it. <laughs> She can barely move. And it had that lovely, uh, that lovely octopus motif at the bottom right. too. Mm -hmm. That right. whenever she moved, it was like it was like a little octopus going across the floor under right. her. <laughs> I liked her dress better than Lily's. Oh yeah. Well, Lily's yeah. was more the um, the vampire, the vampire shroud kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I did like Lily's little necklace that she always did, the little bat. That was nice. Mm -hmm. It was nice. Yes. It was very nice. And what was the the monsters had a pet? Under the steps. Well, it's Spot. Spot, Spot. was it's the dragon, Spot. right? The dragon yeah. under the stairs. And the Adams family, of course, had well, they Cleopatra. Had Cleopatra, the, uh, yeah. The plant, the, the I don't know. Call it? The clinging Venus. vine? No, it Venus. wasn't really a Venus flytrap because it sure didn't look like No, one. it was it was a variation on it. And it was it's just enormous, <laughs> like eight the, feet tall. Your, your, uh, your, your typical basic man-eating kind of plant. Right. <laughs> and what was in the aquarium? Piranhas, probably, I, I believe. they were piranhas. <laughs> I don't know. We never <laughs> so saw like them. Well, <laughs> whatever it was, they sure attacked whatever yeah. they threw in there awfully fast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and there were several of them, apparently. Or just one big just one. Just one big mean one. <laughs> and then they, well, they had the, the rug, the bear rug. Yeah. And, um. Thing. Thing. Right. Thing. <laughs> Pet. Household servant. Uh, knick knack? What? What? Well, what was, was this he? thing? <laughs> well, of course, it was just their handy hand and thing. For the, and for those who don't know, it, 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 of course, most of the time was the hand of Ted Cassidy. You rang. Also, the, <laughs> the uh, played Lurch, of course. In fact, although there were some scenes, and I, I can't, I'm trying to remember who they said did it when, when Lurch and Thing had to be in the same scene. Mm. There was some other person who was assigned the role of Thing. <laughs> I, I know it's in one of these books, here. but who knows if we'd ever be able to find it. <laughs> 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 Was he really playing that harpsichord? <laughs> yeah. hmm. I particularly like the one where he became the big rock star. That was yeah. A, <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't stand all the pressure of being a rock star. <laughs> that, okay. was, that was a fun one. Okay, let's see. Thing, the disembodied hand was usually played by Ted Cassidy, Lurch. When Lurch had to be on camera at the same time as Thing, associate producer 
Jack Vogelin lend his hand. Name lend his down hand. In history. Jack, Jack Vogelin. Vogelin. Give him a hand. <laughs> he had one. <laughs> and, and, and uh, of course, uh, as as cousin it, uh, Henry Silva. Is it Silva? Was it Henry Silva? Cousin who of course it. also played Tweaky. <laughs> <laughs> in oh Rogers. right, that's Felix Silva. Felix. Felix. Felix Silva. Well, Felix Silva. Really Silva. The name. What's your name? <laughs> Mark Schmeidbar. Something, something like that. Mark something Schmeidbar. About that. Yes. <laughs> it's an inside joke. You'll, if you watch the award show, you'll get the joke. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, cousin, you know, it was my favorite because when I was little. And my hair was long. I could brush it all down yeah. over my face and stand there and go like this. <laughs> and put a hat on. A lovely little bowler derby. Right. You couldn't do it. That's true. They, they were all just kind of lost on me. The closest I could ever get to any of them was probably Eddie Munster. Or right. Pugsley. <laughs> Pugsley, what a name, huh? <laughs> Who wanted to be Pugsley? <laughs> no, I don't even think Pugsley wanted to be Pugsley. Yeah, Ken Weatherwax. I guess it would have been cooler <laughs> to play Eddie Munster than to play Pugsley. <laughs> no. Now, I was trying to find out. There was only one uh, Eddie Munster, right? Only one person mm -hmm. played that part. Yes. It was yeah. only a Butch, pa okay. Butch Patrick. Okay. It was only Butch Patrick. Of course, Butch Patrick's gone on to a life of crime, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like all child stars, went on but, to a life of crime. But that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a special show on child stars who did not go into a life of crime. Like that darn <laughs> Pamela Ferdinand. It'll probably be as long as that Burgess Meredith right. show. <laughs> right around there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, and, and uh, one of these double roles again, Beverly Owen and then Pat Priest played Marilyn Munster. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they just decided that, uh, well, what did, what happened? What, why did uh, Beverly Owen decide she decide she needed to leave, leave the show? That's a good question. She the well, ugly one. <laughs> yeah. She decided That's to be right. an actress. She wanted to go back to the well, legitimate theater. Well, they used theater. to pity poor Marilyn because she was so homely and they She's just so knew homely. she would be an old maid. That's and right. Yeah. They would never find her a guy and, oh, pity, 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 <laughs> pity. <laughs> poor Marilyn. Yeah, I don't think I could stay that for more than a season or so. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's see. Um, uh, what I really enjoyed, on, uh, really over the, the the Adams family over the monsters was just this: the bizarre things were happening because the monsters were trying desperately to be, you know, were trying to be Funny. trying to fit <laughs> in. They, you know, Ozzy Harriet. You know, yeah. I mean, it was Ozzy and Harriet. It was just like, you know, we want to be the average American family, and the Adams were like, eh, no. <laughs> they looked. They the mon the Adams family always felt. They look they look more normal, but yet they were more bizarre than the right. monsters, right? Because the monsters just tried their hardest to fit in, except for Grandpa. Grandpa didn't care. <laughs> and then we have a, we have not mentioned Uncle Fester. On oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> who was who was Jackie Coogan? Gomez Uncle. <laughs> yeah, Grandmama was, was Morticia's Grandmama. <laughs> right. Instead of sending him to an old folks' home, they kept him there in the family. In <laughs> Which was very nice because, let's face it, what, what old folks' home would have these people? <laughs> yeah. That'd be scary. That'd be scary. <laughs> Uncle Fester lighting up light bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> Scaring everybody else. Scaring all the little old ladies there. Hey, look. <laughs> hey, Mo. <laughs> that's, that's just what I always thought of yeah. when I looked at Uncle Fester. Totally. Oh, thought, hey, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Light light bulb out of my nose. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that was a big thing for. I thought, of course. Well, what was I? Five or six when the show came out. Amazing, amazing. As the man was a genius. Oh yeah. I thought it was real. <laughs> sure, sure. Why not? And Whoa. Wondered why I couldn't do that. Well, let's see. Looks like we're uh, being uh, given the signal to not get out of here, but to end this segment because we have a surprise second segment on the show tonight. Ooh. <laughs> Shades of things to come? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, again, we just want to say real quick on uh, Tuesdays at 6, Wednesdays at 10, Thursdays at 3, and uh, we'll see you after this message. Or <laughs> we'll see you, we'll see you right after, after this. Blank screen. <laughs> yeah, after this blank screen you're about to see. Here it comes. Good morning and welcome to Meet the Press. I'm Irving R. R. Levine. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's a special segment here on Vast Wasteland. Uh, 
You know, I uh, just want to tell you before we jump into this that next episode we're going to have a special tribute to uh, Gene Roddenberry. Everybody's been asking for a Star Trek episode. And of course, not only is it Star Trek's 25th anniversary, but it's the Monkees' 25th anniversary. Yay. And uh, we have our special guest here, Chris Osborne, who is like Monkees fan number one. <laughs> and, uh, and Chris, uh, let's uh, talk about the big event that's going on. Uh, why don't you tell us about it? Okay, we're doing a big monkeys festival at uh, Crazy Mama's nightclub on campus on High Street there. Uh, we're going to be playing their records to dance to, monkey records all night. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m., goes till maybe midnight, maybe later if we get a big enough crowd, hopefully. It'll be uh, the night before Thanksgiving, November 27th. We'll also have collectibles like you see here, and we'll also have a video shown, their movie Head. Great. And, uh, Great. Be now, a lot of fun. now, for for those of you watching at home, uh, uh, this may actually be airing after that event. We tried to get him on as quickly as possible, but uh, uh, if you've missed it, then I'm sure I'm sure he'll be doing it again. So just be uh, <laughs> be watching out for it. And, but uh, sure, be sure to go down if this is uh, you're actually seeing this before the event. But um, you got a, just a ton of me uh, monkey stuff here, and let's uh, let's take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we got the um, new monkey CD box set. That just came out, mm -hmm. and um, it that just came out recently. Pictures. Yeah, it has some unreleased tunes on there. It has all their big hits in it as well. It has some stuff that's never been released before. Like yeah. monkeys from the vault, huh? Right, the from the tapes, 60s. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> the newest stuff you can get from them since they broke up again, unfortunately. <laughs> Peter Parsifal's pet pig, Porky. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Peter Tork there, and. Um, we got the movie uh, poster from Head, the monkey's cult psychedelic film from 68 that Jack Nicholson produced. Jack oh, that's right. That's Jack right. Jack Nicholson yeah. produced when nobody knew Whoa. who he was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, right. he's in the movie a little bit, too. If you watch it, he's there in the behind the scenes. The whole movie is a behind the scenes type movie anyway. It's a weird flick. That, right. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. Monkey bubblegum cards Let's see. right here. Oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, these guys have all kinds of collectibles. Uh, when you see this poster, you'll see what I mean. And they got more stuff than I could ever have. Which <laughs> I, I wish I had it all. Well, that's surprising. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Few of these. There's more monkey fan clubs than any than I any got other. I put it home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the monkeys have more fan clubs than any almost anybody else. They have, that's that's documented. They mm. they have a lot of fan clubs all over the world. So is the, sh is the yeah. show still on? And speaking of fan clubs, this right here. He, uh, it's not being shown anywhere now. The last was shown on Nickelodeon and uh, MTV. Mm -hmm. That's um, their one of the official fan club kit from the 60s right there, talking about fan clubs. Yeah, their biggest fan club is uh, located in uh, New Jersey. I'm in it. It's a real good club called Monkey Business Fanzine. Let you know everything that's going on with them individually. Like I said, since they're not together again. Um, Let's see. There's all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah. And this one is from the 60s. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and the book that Davy Jones wrote about the, his life story called now, "They Made a Monkey Out of Me," guy right here. The, teen, the teen idol of the monkeys, <laughs> yes. the one all the girls like the best. The going to all the girls like the now, best. Turn it, yeah. turn it over, and you get to see what he looks like now. He's still a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then and now, that was then. This is now, like their last hit record, mm -hmm. and uh, some post, you know, some souvenir books from their concert, from their reunion show. And uh, one from Japan, because the monkeys have fans all over the world. And a, and a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> a monkey. Comic, comic book. book. A, now, I have a different yeah, one, the, but I have one. I and one from when Davy Jones and Mickey Jones toured with their premier songwriters, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart, who wrote some of the monkeys' best tunes, including Last Year in the Clarksville and Hey, Hey, We're the Monkeys. They're really great. And if you can get this in there, it's a big poster Just of all, every kind of monkey memory you could ever possibly we can get that imagine. On. <laughs> now, now uh, a lot of people, uh, when you mention the monkeys, they say, uh, "Oh, well, it's uh, it's just derivative of the Beatles," but really, it isn't. Right. I mean, I've heard that a thousand times. Right. And then I, the greatest defense is, of course, that John Lennon was a big monkey fan. He realized that they were a comedy group. Obviously, they were influenced by them from A Hard Day's Night. But sure. then they went their own way, and then they carved their own niche. And John Lennon was a big fan. He called them the greatest comedy group since the Marx Brothers. And you can't get a better compliment than that. Sure. And the rest of the Beatles were all always said nice things about them too, so can't get any better than that. 
or talking about Star Trek, Leonard Nimoy was once said that he, back in the 60s, his two favorite groups was the Beatles and the Monkeys. So I used that as a great defense. I say, well, Leonard Nimoy liked him. He's Mr. <laughs> Spock, so it must be logical to like the Monkeys, right? <laughs> well, how were the Monkeys actually put together? Well, that's the unique story about them. That's, that's why I hope they make a movie of them someday, because they were thinking of doing that from Davy's book, make a movie of it maybe someday, because they were picked by uh, TV producers to be a TV show. They were never supposed to be a real group. They were supposed to, two of them were musicians, though. Peter Tork and Mike Nez were musicians from the start. And Peter's actually the best musician of all. Even Mike says that. So he can play anything. He's a real versatile. But um, and the other two were more actors, Davey and Mickey, and good singers, too, the main singer. But they were just picked uh, by two producers uh, to be, uh, you know, picked for a TV show. And then the success of the show made them so popular that they became a real group in every sense of the word. Concerts and, and hit records and... Now, and yes. everything. Yes. And now, yes. yeah. <laughs> now, from what yeah. I from what I've heard, uh, yeah. Mickey originally came in uh, trying out to be one of the guitarists in the group, but now I don't know if this is true. I just mm -hmm. what I've heard. But they said they said the right. Exactly they rumors. they said that uh, apparently the producers that thought, well, he looks like a drummer, <laughs> so they put him in the the drumming position. That's I mean that's what I that's what I've heard. Is that true? No, that or is I there don't any, know. Or is there any? validity to that or yeah i don't know i know that i heard that in his audition he sang johnny be good mm -hmm. this is about as much as i can remember i don't didn't hear that he tried out for the be the guitar player or anything mm -hmm. but uh and we'll, we'll that's shall we lay to rest the, the rumor of <laughs> right manson as a monkey <laughs> right that see oh. cause there's there's lots of rumors as to who tried out for the monkeys <laughs> now yeah. manson so, manson <laughs> The rumor is did, but in reality he didn't. That's a definite <laughs> false statement. He was in jail when they had the auditions in '65 for some petty crime. I don't know, couldn't remember what it is, but that's definitely false. The but only one that came the closest was Stephen Stills, and that would have been, of course, a lot better than Manson, I think. <laughs> yeah. well, well, musically so. speaking, anyway, not comedically speaking. <laughs> right. I mean, Stephen Stills had the musical ability, but not the comedic quality, which, mm -hmm. of course, was real important in the monkey's case. So. You're saying that Charles Manson did have the comedic <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a he's horror a movie. Guy. Gore, gory, oh. maybe. He's a nut. <laughs> maybe in some gory horror movie, maybe. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Wow. Wait, so, so, what are the, so what exactly yeah. are they doing now? I mean, the, Okay, the yeah, they were, of course, together up until 89. They did a lot of, re you know, they did reunion tours. They were here in Columbus twice. Um, individually now, the Mickey's been doing tour on his own with a bunch of one-hit artists. Tiny Tim is one of them. He's not really doing that great. Obviously, they're not that great by themselves. They don't do that great by themselves. Mm -hmm. Mickey broke the group up, so I'm a little bit irritated at him right now. He's trying to make it solo and not doing too good. Davy Jones is doing solo, too, and he's supposed to maybe supposed to be in Circleville, but mm -hmm. that's been postponed for <laughs> like a ticket sale. So, no, as I said, they're okay. definitely better together. Yeah. Mike might do a tour next year on his own, which he hasn't done in years and years, and put out a new record. Right. And um, and Peter is semi-retired, but he's supposed to put out a, a new solo album, they say. So Mike said that if the Monkees had got back together in the 90s instead of in 86, they would have uh, well, no, well, he would have been with we, them. So maybe someday they'll get together again, all four of them. We all have our hope. <laughs> yeah. maybe, and maybe in their 30th anniversary, five years from now, or if they get in the Hall of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which we all got our fingers crossed, because like, they deserve to be in there, I think. Well, yeah. we, we, so. we'd like to talk longer, but we really got to wrap <laughs> it up, believe it or not. Boom, we're out of here. Next time on Vast Wasteland, tribute to Gene Roddenberry, and I thank you, Chris, for being here. And uh, for all of us here at Vast Wasteland, we'll see you next time. <laughs>